So, thank you everyone for having me today. It's really been a pleasure to talk about this very new topic as flexibility markets. And actually, I would like to start by introducing our panel members that we have all gathered for to hear. And first, I would like to ask uh, Simon ben Maraz, Head of Technology and Instru Infrastructure at Irena Innovation and Technology Center. Simon, thanks for joining. <laughs> and we also have today Patrick Lindvall from Piccolo Flex, arriving from the UK. He's the Euro European sales lead. <laughs> and today we also have Mindaugas Pranaitis. He's the Head of Innovation and Service Development at ESSO, Distribution System Operator in Lithuania. And we also have two guests online joining today. I would like to start with Yvonne Ruvaida, joining online from Sweden. She's an energy engineer by training and also business strategist at Waterfall Distribution. Yvonne, thank you for joining. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Walt Greentals. Uh, Walt is also joining from the UK. Uh, he's the marketing lead at Kaluza, and Kaluza is an energy platform that has learned how to gather a large number of customer loads and aggregate that for the use of flexibility services. And um, he's the marketing lead at Kaluza. Well, thank you for joining. Oh, yeah. Right, so speaking here, probably for the first time about well, the ma flexibility markets in Latvia, it's a new topic for the distribution system operators. Uh, so what does it really mean? We, for many years, we have known how to build uh, and maintain our electricity network. If there's a congestion risk, we now have learned how to build even bigger transformers and bigger lines. But now the, the best practices are changing, and, and, and this, this, this opportunity of flexibility markets are really rising in Europe. And it's really new for us to think that we could actually pay for a customer to customers for them to reduce load or generation at certain times, and that could allow us to not make investment in new lines and transformers, for example. So, and I'm really happy that we have this great panel today uh, who are experts who have expertise in running the flexibility market. And I would like to start today with Simon. You already met Simon in the morning. And you talk a bit on, on, on the importance of grid flexibility. And perhaps my first question to you really is uh, on the way how we will manage this increasing uh, amount of, of generation and also load. So there are two options. One is obviously direct control of the customers, which kind of seems to obvious. We know how to do to, to We can reduce their consumption or even turn them off in the worst case scenario. But then there's this market-based solution. So just if you could give your perspective on, on, on the market-based solution as, uh, as the solution. Thank you very much. Uh, good, good afternoon. So um, you mentioned this is a, a growing topic, of course. Um, that's not the same uh, complexity having to manage uh, renewables at around 9%. And when we're going to increase the decarbonization of the energy system, uh, our scenario show that we're going to have to manage more than 60% of variable renewables. So there is um, aspects to consider. Of course, there is the uh, nature of the, uh, the resources. They are intermittent, which means that they introduce variability and a certain degree of uncertainty from the uh, system operator. So from that perspective, and of course, it's important to understand this perspective. The flexibility for an uh, 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 operator, for a DSO, is about maintaining in real time the balance between supply and demand. And of course, increasing renewables will propose uh, challenges that today can be solved. And you mentioned there is solutions that today can be implemented um, um, on, on, the, um, on the customer side, but on also on market-based solution. We see sometimes, for example, um, countries introducing capacity markets uh, 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 solution where um, those solutions are really leveraging the nature of a very highly integrated uh, uh, system uh, uh, there. And, and for example, we see the case in, in, uh, in Europe where there is countries with very high uh, share of renewables. I'm thinking about Denmark, for example. I'm thinking about Germany, where uh, they're already innovating and, and, and they're already introducing solutions there. So capacity markets is one. 
The, 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 the second, of course, you mentioned the demand response uh, programs. Uh, the Danish uh, uh, response program are quite advanced. Uh, I'm based in Germany. I, I have a, a program with my utility, a virtual utility actually, where uh, it's very well uh, possible for a customer to adjust based on, on events. And of course, from the operator, there is of course managing the peak demand, but also managing, uh, it's, it's a German uh, world, but in English, it's called the Duken Flotte, so managing events in the year where there is little availability of wind and solar. So this is where we need to have solution coming from the markets uh, that are accepted by the operator to respond to those. Uh, and we have the solution. Of course, gas is in the table, but all our scenarios show that gas uh, will be reduced to the, mi to the very minimal level, and you will have solution. Dispatchable generation uh, coming from renewables and green molecules as well will be able to pass those difficult days for the operators there. So yes, market uh, based in summary is more uh, looking at uh, vertically integrated uh, um, markets. And of course, we, you have other solutions that come where countries have not yet achieved a very high level of renewables, where those solutions are not yet extremely relevant for them. But this will come uh, in 2030 and of course for the net zero target for, for 2050. No, thanks, Simon, for that. And just wondering then from your perspective as working at Ayurveda, who is like have really the global perspective, uh, who is leading at the moment in terms of developing and, and running uh, flexibility markets? Yeah, so uh, I'm not, I'm not going to introduce new news, but you, we have very good example in the uh, developed part of the world. Um, you have Europe with the countries with very high share of renewables that are leading the way. Um, the US as well, of course, is coming back, I would say, but they always had very good solution on advanced metering system, grid management solution that are, let's say, putting them in, in the, as a pioneer and at the forefront of those uh, new services. Uh, you have also to look at China with huge investments. Uh, we, I'll, I'll be next month uh, in Shanghai uh, to discuss these topics. Huge investment in smart grid technologies. So they are making, preparing to address those aspects of replacing or decommissioning high number of fossil fuel plants and replacing them with viable renewables. So uh, there, in the developing part of the world, we have seen good example, for example, in uh, Chile, in Mexico, where they have introduced very good solutions that are introducing responses to their specific grid. Uh, Chile has a very specific grid along the coast and need to address certain issue of, uh, due to the, to the geography. And uh, of course, India and Brazil are uh, just behind because they are ha announcing extremely ambitious plan to introduce renewables. And the operators have already asked the questions how to address those issues. The ones that are a bit lagging behind are uh, countries with the lack of uh, very stable and operating grid infrastructure. Uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have issues of uh, those aspects being not yet prevalent there. And of course, they are sometimes investing in uh, what we call stranded assets that may, will pose problems because they are locking themselves in, in solutions that in the future will not actually deliver the flexibility that is needed to respond to the, uh, to the other situation. Thank you, Simon. That actually what I heard is that as long as you have stable power supply, you, you are pretty much ready for flexibility markets to at least investigate that as an opportunity compared to traditional solutions. Well, Patrick, if I may ask to you now, uh, also obviously you came from the UK, you work for the Piccolo Flex, who is the leading platform that brings together the, the, the DSOs and together with all the customers providing this flexibility. Could you give a bit of the perspective from the UK? Obviously, people have heard that you've been running flexibility markets for four years now. The numbers in terms of uh, capacity contracted and tendered uh, are going up. So we would really love to hear your perspective of why you are success so successful. Well, thank you very much, Petris, and <clears throat> thank you so much for having me on the, on the panel today. Um, I think there are many contributing factors to why the UK is perceived as a more mature market when it comes to flexibility. Um, but I think there are possibly two overarching um, contributors that, that's led to where we are today. Um, so the UK, as many other countries, are faced with the challenge around um, you know, decarbonization, decentralization, and, and, and digitalization or digitization. 
Um, and I think this was, this was realized by the UK government um, a while back where they released the, the Energy Act. Um, and I think the collaboration between the UK government and the regulator of GEM has been a successful one. Um, and I think the, the regulatory incentives are important to get um, to start the process properly. Um, and Ofgem released um, a, a regulatory framework called RIO. And for anybody who's not familiar with what RIO is, it uh, stands for revenue equals uh, incentive plus uh, innovation plus output. And as part of this framework, um, they also released a mechanism called the TOTEX mechanism, which basically incentivize um, system operators to look at, um, to approach this issue in a more holistic way, and not just looking at the capex piece, which is the traditionally what you would do, but also look at operating expenditure and, and combine that into a TOTEX mechanism. So from a regulatory perspective, that really sort of gave clear directives and regulations and incentive for the system operators to change. I think another really important piece to point out here is that there need to be a willingness and a curiosity from the system operators to really embrace the, the, the new reality that we're heading towards. And I think the, the system operators in the UK have been very good at embracing this and together with the ENA, which is the Energy Network Association, uh, in the UK, I've been collaborating and, and really effectively starting to, to, to take action on the route to, to flexibility. So I think if you look at what's happened in the UK since then, is you can almost look at this as a flywheel effect. So it sort of starts with sort of strong um, incentives from a regulatory point of view. That gives confidence to the DSOs to go out and start embracing uh, the new possibilities. So when you start getting um, congestions in the grid, which you will eventually have, um, that sort of creates the need for flexibility. And when that need for flexibility arises, you also incentivize marketplaces like Piclo to go out and innovate. Um, and that innovation piece also then brings confidence to the flexibility service providers, which is an extremely important piece in making flexibility work. It gives them confidence to go out and invest in assets um, in the network, and that ultimately creates the liquidity that is so important um, to, to, to have. And that uh, feeds up to the top again, and you start a new cycle. So I think this flywheel effect really has an important piece, and it's all sort of been triggered by regulatory uh, incentives and, and, and collaboration from the system operators. Thank you, Patrick, for that. And I really love that you actually used the word incentive. So it's like a carrot and stick question. And it seems that the, the regulator gave the right incentives that actually DSOs are encouraged to, to go that way. And it's not like that the push and you have to find a solution. So yeah, th thanks for that. Uh, also, we have Yvonne here. And, and, and probably next question would go to you. Uh, you're working for a large distribution company, and you are, what Enfolo has also worked for with flexibility services now for a couple of years. And maybe s since I'm also from DSO, I would like to really hear, how did you get that, that uh, push for flexibility through the company? Like, uh, how, how did you get it implemented, if you could maybe give a bit of the perspective? We are still working with the implementation. It's a long uh, journey. I don't think we have the same strong incentives from the regulatory side in Sweden like we have in UK. I do think it is a vital issue. Um, but in Sweden, we have um, not a big issue with decarbonization because we have a lot of fossil free electricity. But we have the situation with um, um, uh, with electrification of the society. So a lot of actors want to electrify because they want to use fossil free electricity. And um, it's from the transport sector, it's industry, it's, uh, it's new industries, but also old industry. So we really have, um, um, I mean, it's a situation that is disruptive with a lot of new customers wanting to connect to the grid. Uh, big customers, if you look at the load, very, very fast if you compare with the, the past times. So we do have one incentive that's actually to be able to connect customers uh, in the 
uh, how fast they want to be connected. But we are working on, on both flexi market-based flexibility, but also with uh, non-firm connection agreements. And we do know that we have to work with both. So it's actually understanding coming regulation that is very clear on that we need to work with market-based uh, solutions also. That is one of the drivers and we want to understand what is it, how do we work with market-based flexibility. But we also have one, one um, driver that is uh, a little bit new for us. It was not a driver in the beginning, but we do understand that our existing customers are becoming more and more flexible and they are changing their behavior. So uh, existing customers do not act as we have planned for in the past. And this uh, is also something that is a driver for us to work with flexibility because then we will be able to solve new kind of situations coming up because existing customers are changing their behavior because of electricity prices or because of uh, participating on balancing markets or having their own uh, production uh, on their own site. So this is also a, a driver, I would say quite a new driver uh, that makes it important for us to understand flexibility, to participate, to be able to purchase and coordinate existing flexibility. So there are many different types of, of drivers. Thanks, Simon. And, and how do you introduce the change internally in a company? Because you need to increase the risk appetite for that too. Because obviously it's very safe and you, you, you just have a bigger transformer or lines, but, and, and now taking that risk that customer may not actually not deliver. How, how do you approach that risk within a company? Um, I mean, we, we have a, had a project in our company that's called Bioflex. And in this Bioflex um, project, we've been working a lot with how can we judge risks, um, different kind of risks, risks, risks in our uh, net planning, uh, risk with different operating situations, and also what is flexibility? I mean, it is managing an increased risk, risk with something that's not risk-free. So we're talking a lot in a new way about risks that we perhaps didn't do before. Uh, but I think the challenging thing is, is actually that when, when we work with flexibility, we see a lot of things in our organization that we need to change to be able to work with flexibility. I think that's, that's the hardest issue, not working with risks, but understanding that, okay, we need better information about uh, how it is in our grid. We need... Uh, we perhaps have wrong information about assets or, or metering. Uh, we need to understand things in a different way because working with flexibility, you work uh, a lot more digitalized uh, than you do otherwise. So flexibility is driving digitalization and digitalization has demands on, on how it works in your organization and what knowledge you have and uh, so it's in a way an improvement work, but this takes a lot of energy in the organization. And I think that that is a challenge, the biggest challenge. Uh, I wouldn't, if it would be easy to just put on flexibility on the surface, uh, it would be much easier. But the problem is it changes the way you think and work and you have to improve your processes in every part of the organization almost. And that is what makes it so challenging. And just very curious. So you need time. You need time <laughs> and, and effort and a lot of discussions. And, and who is leading that transition? Is it the, is it the business team? Is it innovation? Uh, how do you get different across companies all Companies in, in Sweden do differently. We have a, um, a project in Vattenfall distribution that is prioritized where we um, work with the implementation work together with the, the company. So it, it, I mean, we have some projects who were like pilots and demonstrations, but now we have like a organization uh, working with the implementation work together with the organization. Um, but I, I, I do know they do different in different companies in Sweden. One company is working with, they have a unit uh, where they have all the new competences needed and then they try to 
you know, cooperate with the rest of the organization. I'm not sure that there is one solution, but you need to understand that you need to ha address all the different perspectives. It's the operators, it's the grid planning, it's how to make uh, forecasts, it's about new business models, about the new regulation and understanding also the new regulation. So it's about metering and it's about, of course, um, I mean, exchanging information and information architecture. So you really need a lot of different competences uh, and you need time so that more people will get knowledgeable because it's, it's, I mean, one of the questions I got from business side very early was why should we work with markets? We are, we are working with the grid. <laughs> we don't, we shouldn't work with markets, but we do, a, we need to understand market design, market coordination, how does other market works, how does flexibility works to understand flexibility. So you need that competence today. I mean, I'm a power system engineer. I didn't work with markets when I started to work with flexibility markets, but you need to understand the wholesale market. You have, you need to understand aggregation models. You need to understand balancing. So, I mean, there's like new competences needed in the business of the grid operator. And, and, and that's a key issue. Thank you, Ivan, for the comments. Really, it was interesting to hear the insights from what else, what else false experience. And we have another grid operator here uh, in Daugas. So Lithuania was one of the probably last countries that have introduced into legislation uh, rules for flexibility services for distribution system operators. Could you just share a bit of the, this experience? Why exactly now? And then what was SO's role in this? Okay, good afternoon. It's nice to be here. And it's a very comfortable place, so we will have a long discussion, <laughs> I would say. And yes, we are really happy that we pass first stage uh, of uh, flexibility services. We uh, transfer from European directives to our national law, uh, the rules, uh, the way how to do this flexibility. And this uh, way was quite long. We start since uh, 2019, then uh, 2022 in December, we get uh, a proof pro from our regulator that is the uh, rules uh, and uh, descriptions are correct. So we have a, like a, a first stage finished and now we can start talking with uh, a market. Uh, uh, what colleagues mentioned, uh, we have a paper which uh, allows us uh, go and show and uh, test uh, flexibility services. So the way was long and uh, uh, cooperation between ministry and regulator was really in very, very good uh, shape, I would say. And we have a long discussion with TSO, supplier, aggregator, uh, procurement commission, uh, scientists, uh, and uh, many consultation because uh, flexibility service is new, as was mentioned uh, of a colleague, a previous colleague, and uh, we do not have a um, experience on, on that. So we are happy and uh, now we have legislation. Now we are looking uh, for uh, partners on another side uh, in the market who uh, can uh, sell us with uh, flexibility services. So we are, this year we plan to run several uh, procurements of flexibility services. And uh, thanks to our partners from uh, UK, we learn a lot uh, from Piclo because UK is a leader, I, I think, and we learn a lot from them. We tested uh, the platform. So, and the third thing is the European uh, Commission funded project, ONET. We are participating together with the uh, Sadalisticals, with the PICLO. Also, together, we learn a lot. And the countries like uh, Lithuania, we can take this experience and uh, implement uh, in our networks. And uh, also was mentioned we need do the circle, first stage done, now we need to test it, come back, uh, improve our regulation because when we write the document uh, one year ago, now it looks different and we see um, things uh, which should be improved. So it's, uh, I agree that it should be do in, in a circle. So it's uh, just, uh, we think we did a lot, but it's just the beginning of a long journey. And uh, yeah, that's my impression. Thanks, Mindaugas, and it was interesting to hear that also you started actually in 2019 already 
working, looking at this until the legislation was introduced. But maybe could you also reveal as a small secret, you are, the distribution system in Lithuania is very, very similar to ours. And where do you see the business case for flexibility, first of all? Yeah, it's a good question because we get this question from our technical department. Where is the business case uh, flexibility? It looks fine. And yeah, was also mentioned con congestion management and we do not, uh, we, it's not appearing now. We do not get, uh, we have a, a congestion, but we are close to congestion management and uh, it's close to the limit. And one case is in cold winter, uh, when heating is uh, up, there are uh, some places where flexibility service can be applied instead of uh, reconstruction. Second one is when, uh, for example, TSO uh, grid line should be maintained or reconstruct. We will disconnect, and in order to to build new network, we can uh, apply flexibility service in particular place uh, for some short uh, period uh, to 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 avoid blackout and etc. And third thing, uh, the um, renewables. Uh, electron vehicles, uh, it's uh, implemented in the network, and I, we think that will create a problem which could be solved by flexibility. Uh, for this, we are only, how to say, investigating. And finally, with uh, new uh, customer connections uh, can be applied, uh, and uh, as, as one mentioned, we plan to um, test uh, several places, different uh, uh, different places and to see how flexibility services can help us because uh, if we apply flexibility service anyway we have to ensure resiliency and uh, it, it should work so now we are in a piloting phase and we have i would say three three different uh, business cases we will test it, uh, uh, the flexibility right thank you mendalgas for that does that seem similar to the uk all those use cases Yeah, I, um, I, I think it's, um, the challenges are fundamentally the, the, the same, but as we talk about, there are differences in, in the markets that needs to be addressed. Um, you can't just roll out the same solution across all different markets. Um, but the, the, you know, what's been mentioned already so far, the, 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 the thought processes and the complications and the discussions um, are, are largely the same. Um, I think from a technology point of view, you can be frustrating from time to time because you want to move fast, um, but this has to take a bit of time. This is a systematic change and discussions has to be held uh, in, in multiple levels. Um, but, but yeah, I would say that it's, uh, it's very similar to what we see in, 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 in different places in Europe. Do you want to comment? Um, similarly, yes, I think, uh, first of all, congratulations to passing from the EU directives to the law. I think that's a great achievement. I don't think that's very long, 2019, 2023, so that, that's good. Um, no, for example, we've seen a very successful uh, demand side response uh, program in Germany, for example. Uh, the, the Bundesnetz Agentur, the, the network uh, agency, showed that there was up to 9 gigawatts available for demand side response for uh, disconnection less than 5 minutes and up to 2.5 gigawatts for uh, more than an hour um, uh, flexibility for more than uh, one hour continuously. So that's a very good example. Uh, Chile has uh, announced and launched a, a day ahead uh, market for energy and ancillary services. That's very good. And uh, Mexico has a very good uh, capacity market to procure flexible resource as well announced as part of their new uh, programs. Thank you for bringing in that global perspective in the game. So it's not just Europe working on this, it's actually happening everywhere in the world. Right, then maybe you're just gonna give word also to Waltz and Kaluza. And, and Kaluza maybe have solved one of the most complicated questions on actually how to engage even a small households in such flexibility markets, because it's easy to, to get customers when you have one, two megawatts that, that you can, uh, let's say just turn off on, on demand, but like you, Kaluza has uh, aggregated thousands of households and, and their loads. And yeah, maybe Walt, if you wanna kind of bring in the, the, the experience you have, and, and, and if, if people are really willing to, to, 
to give the control over their electric appliances and for, for a couple of dollars, or, or there's more to earn. So yeah, I would really love to hear your perspective. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Um, so yeah, we, we operate in, I guess, what you would call a niche space, which is about um, engaging and consumers in households um, in flexibility. Um, and it's, you know, it, it is a complex space, and, and I'm not gonna say that that is something that will solve all of the grid flexibility needs, right? Uh, trying to solve for net zero and really decarbonizing the grid is a, is a puzzle, and that's one of the pieces uh, you need there. Um, in terms of you know, how we've done it, so we've, we've been operating in this space for the past four years. We've been building a, you know, we've built a software solution that is being offered to uh, retailers, so energy retailers around different markets. UK is the main one, but also US, California, um, so Australia and also some EU countries. Um, and the main thing we're aiming to do is we are aiming to help uh, energy suppliers offer and consumers um, a seamless way to connect with the grid and become basically a prosumer. Uh, and there's two ways to do that, right? There's engagement tools where customers can actively play a role in responding to certain grid needs or uh, the automation, which is where we build actual integrations with different device manufacturers. So for example, a car manufacturer gives us access to the telematics and we basically optimize the EV charging in a more um, active uh, manner. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, we've got into a, a, a good number of, you know, more than 20,000 devices connected uh, around the world. Um, in terms of, you know, how do customers get engaged? There's, there's different factors, right? There's a monetary benefit, obviously. Um, as you said, you know, it's not a lot of money to a customer, so it's never going to be uh, a massive difference on their wallet. It's going to reduce their energy bills, and different technologies uh, drive different cost reductions. Um, but it's actually about kind of a trade-off between how much money you save, but also how easy it is to actually take an activity and, and save money in the market. And there's also additional benefits, which we've seen, which is not just monetary, it's about uh, reducing their carbon footprint. And, and things that we've seen in other markets work is really people becoming aware of the role they play on the grid and making an impact or a positive impact on the energy system on their side. So uh, again, UK is a great example where uh, National Green Grid uh, ran a project last year, which is all about managing winter peak. Uh, and they realized that their capacity reserve isn't uh, massive for the winter peak. Um, so they launched a scheme called uh, DFS, so Demand Flexibility Service, where basically Customers got paid a certain amount of money if they managed to reduce their load at peak time by kilowatt. It was made, you know, they made it very easily accessible for people. Uh, and, you know, there was a level of awareness for people that, um, you know, there's a shortage of gas supplies due to different global events, right? And, 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 and really kind of awareness of the fact that, you know, people need to be careful about when they use electricity and how they use it or, gas for that uh, same reason. Um, so uh, that kind of raised the awareness from the kind of uh, customer's perspective about the fact that, you know, flexibility is an essential part to decarbonize, but also to uh, create a more independent self-sustaining energy system, which is again, a, quite an important topic. Um, so a lot of the emotional factors actually play a role in why customers are starting to engage more with this. Yes, there's some money in it, not a lot, but there's a lot of emotional drivers that uh, once you make it easy enough for people to do, uh, that really um, attract people. So for example, one of the things we have done to, to give kind of um, some shine a light on how we've made flexibility really simple is uh, in the UK uh, and in Australia, actually, so customers that uh, get an EV, right? Um, uh, you know, we connect those EVs to flexibility markets, and from a customer's perspective, it's 
really easy, right? You you pay, let's say, 20 cents for your electricity for the whole household per kilowatt hour, right? Uh, we offer a rate that's one third of that. So they'll have to pay seven cents for the electricity that only goes into the car. Um, and, and, and all they need to do is opt into, yes, I'll let Calusa uh, control the charging of my car. The reality for most cars that charge at someone's home is that they plug in. So they're plugged in for an average of eight hours a day. They actually need to charge for an hour, hour and a half. So there's a lot of room to play uh, from a kind of grid perspective and also market perspective. So to a customer, it's as simple as I'm opting into this scheme and I'll pay uh, one third of my average electricity price for my EV charging. So it's super simple. There's some saving, uh, they know the benefit and it benefits the system because you have an asset that is now fully flexible and can be used at a time that is best for the grid, best for the system. And at a time when you have more renewables available, because again, it's hard to control how much wind output you get or how much solar you get. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, it's money, but it's also simplicity and making it as easy for a customer to understand why they should do it beyond just savings. Does that make sense? Thank you, Vault, for that. Uh, then maybe just a follow-up question. Uh, so you talk about direct control of those devices remotely. Is, is, is that always the case? Or, or do you see also for opportunity for the cases you, for, for the devices you can't integrate and you just send a signal to a customer and hope that it will turn off the device? Or is, it, is there also opportunity for those kind of flexibility? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's a mixture of uh, both. The way we look at things is, I think there's a certain... Um, uh, asset or device type in customer's home that um, you would look at and consider as, you know, a high, the mo it, it's very valuable when you automate the control. So, and there's a limited amount of devices that applies to it. It's something in the HVAC space, so be it a heat pump or in a warm country, it could be an AC unit uh, and an EV and potentially a battery in a home, right? Those are assets that use a lot of energy or relatively high power and actually have quite a lot of flexibility um, around, you know, when they're plugged in and how you do things. So for those assets, you know, automation is the best way to do uh, do it. And it also, from a network perspective, gives a DNO, a TSO, uh, a lot more, I guess, um, credibility or a lot more reliability, right? Because automated demand response is fundamentally more reliable and more predictable uh, than pure behavior based. That being said, there's also a lot of value in behavioral demand response. So for um, just, you know, other small appliances, right? There are, I guess, diminishing returns in trying to integrate with a washing machine or a fridge, right? It's, it's a small load. Um, it's part of, you know, a lot of kind of everyone's daily life. So there's value in, in behavioral nudges to people to uh, suggest, oh, you should use less at this time because of X, Y, and Z. And then it becomes more about messaging. Um, and yes, it's less predictable, but it's proven to work uh, in a lot of markets. So, you know, we've seen great results in the UK from the DFS trial, which was largely just a nudge for people on a day ahead basis. You could tell them, hey, between this and this time, uh, you should use less electricity uh, and there's a scoring system. If you drop your load below X amount, you get a, a higher payment. There's different ways to incentivize people to do that. And similarly in California, um, obviously it, you know, it's, it's behavioral demand response is quite, uh, I guess, uh, well established in California, right? The news talk about you know, when I went there, for example, you would watch the news and they would just tell people, oh, tomorrow, by the way, we should, everyone should use less electricity in these in these times because of the extreme heat waves. Um, and everyone's quite aware of that, you know, that they need to reduce the usage. Obviously, it is driven by an extreme in a market, which is, you know, they have forest fires, they have actual extreme events that are triggered by uh, using electricity at a wrong time or, or, or um, by overloading the grid. So, you know, you once you go through that, you kind of learn about the fact that you should be very careful when you use 
electricity, but it's, you know, it ha definitely has a role to play. And I think uh, in combination with automated dem demand response in households, the behavioral aspect uh, is important. And in a lot of ways, customers learn, uh, they have a synergy where someone who gets an EV uh, wants to understand why they should charge their car at a different time. And once they learn that, they understand that in general, they should try and use electricity more overnight or more during the day because there's more solar or wind available. And it goes the other way as well. If a customer is familiar with the behavioral demand response and understands why they should try and reduce peak time usage, when, whenever they get the electric vehicle, whatever, 2025, 2030, when they get, get that electrical vehicle, they will understand that if they charge at home, they should uh, under, you know, they should charge it at times when more renewables are available, are, are available um, and it just creates this good synergy in general and customer awareness, I think. Thanks, Walt. So indeed, I see also that's about the learning curve of the customer. But then from the DSO perspective, maybe this is a question I have to my colleagues here from DSOs as well. Uh, the biggest concern is that what if the customer doesn't deliver? So you, you expect that there will be a lot of the reduction, it doesn't happen, and, and that's a real risk of congestion. Any solutions? Yeah, I, I, I do think Evolve. there's one solution. Um, uh, I do think that we need to understand the risk and, of course, make a risk analysis. How big will the risk be if... if I mean, some of the customers uh, will not answer. Uh, and if it's only one customer, it can be very tricky, of course. But sometimes we will need some kind of insurance. Uh, it will be different for different grid situations. But sometimes you perhaps need to combine market base with non-farm connection agreements uh, where you can perhaps, for example, have methods in the grid that could, you know, you could use in the worst case scenario. But I do think you really have to look at and assess different grid situations and try to find sometimes some kind of, I don't know, find a word now in English, but backup uh, solution that you can use if, um, the worst case scenario uh, occurs. Thanks, Yvonne. Anyone else would like to give some ideas? Yes, maybe uh, I bring an example from the other side of the hemispheres. Uh, in Australia, I mean, they have a market-based solution, but in some occasion where there is very low supply and high demand, they have also, uh, uh, let's say, load shedding uh, solution to do that. Overall, most of the time, it's about behavioral changes, and this is something that takes time uh, at the customer end, and, but uh, we see a lot of potential of digital tools to help customers understand the, the need to, to uh, be an uh, integral actor in, this, uh, in, the, in those uh, new solutions. Thank you I for that. I c if I can add on that, just to talk about some of the uh, ways to mitigate that, right? The different markets have taken different approaches, but there's, you know, it, 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 at this, it, in this case, right, it becomes a market design problem, right? Um, you can put all of the risk on someone like us and make it a penalty, like a massive penalty, uh, if you don't deliver what you said, and it's up to us to be able to really guarantee that something's going to come out of it. And if it doesn't, you get penalized. Texas is a good example of that. Alternatively, you can build a market that has a lot of capacity reserve uh, and it's there on standby in case some of the cheaper solutions don't come uh, to help, right? Um, so I think in a lot of ways, this is a, a market design problem and, and, you know, people are going to come to market and will provide uh, capabilities that can deliver, right? For, our approach, for example, is when it comes to behavioral demand response, we take a, a very conservative view of how much we can deliver so that we can ensure that what, what we tell a DSO is easily achievable. Most of the times we actually go above what we said we could deliver and there's problems in that as well. Uh, but uh, I'd say, you know, especially at scale, uh, it's quite, you know, human behavior is quite easy to predict, uh, especially at scale tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers, uh, you can quite easily predict how much you'll get out of it. So you'd be surprised uh, about that. Thank you for the comments. 
I guess with this we can also wrap up the session. I want to thank all the colleagues for sharing the experience from very new to flexibility markets to the most probably experience that we have at the moment here. And so, yeah, thank you all. And if you don't mind, I will just wrap up uh, in, in Latvian. So, yeah, paldies visiem, kas apmeklē, kas skatījās tieši raidē. Mums šodien tiešām bija pieci fantastiski runātāji ar pilnīgi dažādu pieredzi, gan no tirgus puses, gan no sistēmas operātora puses. Bija, protams, visi interesanti redzēt, ka, kad šie elastības tirgi attīst tikai ne Eiropā, bet īstenībā arī viet, vietām, kurām mēs viem, ne, nevienmēram zinājis, kā Latvijā un Amerikā, kad nu, visi tīkla operātori tā teikt, kuri stabili uh, elektrības piegādi, tad skatās uz alternatīvām tīkla pārbūvē. Uh, protams, bija ļoti interesanti arī dzirdēt no Kaluzes, kuri, kuriem ir pieredze, kas skatīties, kā var pat mājasamniecību tā teikt, iekārtas agregēt, lai nodrošinātu šos pakalpojumus, un kad, ja klientam tas process ir vienkārši, tad, tad viņi noteikti ir ieinteresēti arī, tā teikt, adot šo kontroli, teiksim, par elektroauto uzlādi, kā piemēr, tā teikt, jā, paldies arī par tiem ieskatiem. Protams, arī bija interesants redzēt, kā lietuviešu stāstu, ka tas ir, Ja mēs šodien varbūt pirmo reizi atklāt runājam par elastības tirgu no sistēmas, sadala sistēmas operātora perspektīvas, tad nu, tas prasa laiku un tas nav tad, ka mēs vienu paši nāktu klajā risinājumu. Mums jāsēdā kopā regulātori, mēs dzirdējām, ka ESO arī iestaistīs arī pat universitātes šajā, šajā pasākumā un citus uh, uh, puses, lai, lai saprast, kā virzīties uz priekšu, un tas tik tiešām prasa laiku, lai ieviesu šādu veidu pakalpojumus. Tirgu. Un, protams, jāpaldies arī Patrikam, kurš ienesa mazliet perspektīvi no, no Anglijas, kuri, kuri ir šobrīd veiksmīgākā tirgus uh, platforma. Tā kā, jā, ceru, ka tas bija mazliet interesanti. Šie kungi vēl būs uh, šeit pat uzturēsies un droši var arī pēc tam uzdot jautājumu pēc sesijas. Paldies! Thank you, everyone! Thank you! Thank you to all the speakers! And thank you to the great moderator, Peters Lūsis Peters!